Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Politics Matters podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Jakubowski. And in today's podcast, we're joined by my good friend and friend of the show, Evan Scrimshaw. He uh, has had quite a streak with these primaries. He's also my favorite Canadian. So, Evan, how's your day been going, man? Uh, my day's been good. It's been busy with Canada stuff that I'm not going to bore you with. Um, I could really use Dr. Oswin in this damn primary because I had a I had like a victory lap tweet lined up last night that I can't send if Dr. Oz loses the primary. Uh, so I would greatly enjoy Dr. Oz to win this primary so I could take my victory lap. I too would benefit from Dr. Oz winning this primary because I actually had McCormick coming in third by like a substantial amount. I think I had him at like 21% and then you might win. So. Oh, you oh, you bought Trafalgar? Unfortunately, I did. This is actually the first time I've trusted Trafalgar in a while because I usually dislike every aspect of their polling. Yeah, but the thing, yeah, but the thing is, Trafalgar got like Ohio really right. You know, they were actually quite good with uh, Vance and Mandel and uh, Dolan. Yeah, like I don't like I don't think I don't think trusting like like I'm gonna be completely honest here. Like Doctor Oz winning, like even if he wins by you know 400 votes or whatever the number might be i'm making up a number right now um it's not like it's going to be the impressive and emphatic victory that i was predicting for odds over mccormick no. like mccormick massive like massively outperformed my expectations and even and that's true whether or not i still get to take my dumb victory lap yeah it's some it's distant point in the future functionally it's a the range of outcomes will be determined by literally 700 800 votes, right? So it's functionally you're getting the same margin. It's just that uh, Oz will narrowly finish ahead or McCormick will narrowly finish ahead. So this is still like McCormick might lose, but it, it's still a massive overperformance and he overperformed both of our expectations, especially considering he was running, you know, he didn't run on it, but he was a, a less uh, conservative Republican. He was a Bush. He signed, he, he signed, signed the amicus for you. He signed the amicus brief, which anyone who's ever, who's read uh, my columns over the lines on this topic or listened to me do any media appearance I've ever done on whatever aspect of this topic. He signed the 2013 pro gay marriage, Republicans for gay marriage amicus brief. And the other people who signed that fucking amicus brief are all like Lincoln Project appointees or on cable TV. And apparently he's a bit like might be about to be a senator. So I don't know. Good for him. I mean, yeah. Uh, so we're going to, that. I, I guess that's a preview for what we talked about today. We'll talk about Pennsylvania, we'll talk about the primaries, we'll talk about the gubernatorial election as well. We'll do um, some Senate stuff, some governor stuff, just a 2020, just pre-2022 talk. But um, so actually. We also, can we also make yeah. kind of math and Cawthorn, please? Oh, gladly, gladly. Perfect. Great. I'm Perfect. not even pretending to be unbiased here. This is my podcast. I'm gonna. We can talk about <laughs> Trader too. Trader looks like he's going down as of right now, but uh, the guys over the guys over Split Ticket have called that one, and I think I agree with their assessment, or at the very least, their logic seems sound. So the only thing with that race, though, is as of so we're recording this on a Thursday night. Um, or no, Wednesday it's, night. it's Wednesday night. Yeah. Whoops. Um, but. Right now, if you go on New York Times, you can see uh, we're at at the time of this recording, we're at 49 or 54 percent in. And it hasn't really changed. Um, Schrader's down by 21 points. But the thing is, the shoots kind of which is home of Bend uh, is or uh, was uh, McLeod Skinner's best county. And it's basically all in. And Schrader's still Clackamas is literally 8 percent in. And that's Schrader's best county right now. Uh, and then Marion's 42% in traders winning there by 12. Uh, and so like, I would like, it, uh, I'd much rather be Jamie McLeod Skinner right now, but like, I, I don't know if I would call it yet. I, I don't know enough to yeah, but make you're, a projection yet. Yeah. But you're a coward. So who cares what you're comfortable calling? So, the guys so you're going to call it. I'm, I mean, I'm not making, I'm not making the call on my basis. The guys over at Split Ticket know what, the, know what they're talking about. And if they're willing to make that assessment, they, I trust that they have given it enough thought and that they are aware of the intricacies of that district enough that they're, they are not the kinds of people to make such a call rationally for the sake of like Twitter cloud. They clearly are quite confident. I, yeah. I like, I don't, I'm not a decision desk dude. I just like I yeah because you're yeah because yeah, you're yeah because you're a little coward. I'm I'm getting slandered already. 
you you decided to, you decided to ask me to come on your podcast. This is your own fault. I, I should have known. It actually it it, it comes with um, asking it literally it, to come on your podcast. It I, literally I does. I don't understand why you're expecting anything different from me. Okay. Anyways, um, so we're gonna throw Evan under the bus here uh, for the start, and we're gonna so. But this is a game, if you call it that, that we came up with 15 minutes ago. And so I was uh, asking Evan about Canadian geography because he's Canadian. Uh, and because since I'm American, I'm like inept with Canadian geography. Uh, and so just for political reasons, and because tonight's pretty eventful for Canadian politics, um, I have a list of seven cities and, and we're going to ask Evan to compare them to American cities, politically speaking. So the first on this is Calgary. Houston 25 years ago when because the thing about Calgary is all the like rich wealthy whites vote for conservative parties because all of like Calgary industry and I mean like the law firms the banks the accounting firms everything they're all like flooded with oil money right all the all the law firms have the oil as have the oil companies as their clients all the banks Anchorage be a- take the oil money. The problem with Anchorage is that Anchorage doesn't count as a city because it's not truly America. It's actually Canada. Hold on. You're claiming Alaska now? Yes. This is imperialism. This is you literally bought bad. you literally bought Alaska from the Russians. Shut up. Good. I like taking Russian territory. Okay, like so- I am very pro Seward's fully. Calgary's used to have all the oil industry and, and all the rich whites vote for conservatives anyways. Okay, thank you. Uh, next city, Winnipeg. Uh, 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 ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. Ooh, stumped him. Uh, well, no, I'm also drunk. I don't remember, so. It's Indi- no, Indianapolis. The it's city itself fairly... is that liberal? Oh, yeah. No, like the liberal, there's, oh God, there's only like one conservative inside the city proper, depending on, well, people from Winnipeg might get mad at me if I'm, I don't consider Charleswood the city. So they have one conservative MP, two, if you count Charleswood as the city, you shouldn't. Um, no, the city is majority liberal in a bastion of conservative insanity around it. Okay, uh, so I guess if that's the analysis, the analogy you're going for Indianapolis works. Uh, okay, let's let's do um, let's do Kitchener next. Uh, Austin, except much, much, much lamer. Yeah, fuck Kitchener. Okay, so uh, while we're on the topic of Ontario cities that aren't Toronto or Ottawa, let's do London. Uh, 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 what's the city with the has Penn State in it again? Uh, oh, that's call it. Uh, it's State College. State College. Yeah, it's State College. It's okay. Literally, it's it's like a it's like a formal industrial area, but like literally, the only thing that's keeping one fucking like alive as a city is the university, and it's the biggest party school in the world. So yeah, State College. Okay. Uh, last Ontario city for now, Thunder Bay. The most interesting thing about Thunder Bay is that it was once is that apparently the like people who do Nielsen ratings um, consider Thunder Bay and North Bay a continuous media market. And Nate Silver once wrote a column arguing there should be a hockey team in the North Bay Thunder Bay metro area, which uh, does not exist because they're on the other sides of the fucking province. Wait, 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 hold on. That. Those two cities combined have like a hundred something thousand people, right? Like they're not that big, aren't, aren't they? No, I don't remember the like, I don't remember the logic of it, but I think it's they watch a lot of hockey because there's something else to do in North Bay and there's something else to do in Thunder Bay. But they're like on like North Bay is on like East Northern Ontario and Thunder Bay is like by is like sort of like over sort of by like Illinois, like sort of north of Illinois ish. Yeah. Like they're nowhere close. Um, 
So, so he's now I, I'm trying to avoid Missoula Billings uh, market is, is what I'm hearing. Yes, basically. That's the logic we're using. Yes, basically. And that's also the comparison. Montana works great as a comp. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So then uh, the la- so I've got the last two. Uh, the last one is a trick question. So be prepared for that. But I'll give you one more before we go into that mess. Um, Edmonton. Uh, uh, damn it. That's hard. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's Orlando. It's it has a big, it has a big tourist well. attraction. It has a sports team that is perpetually mediocre, despite the fact that it gets elite talent and it still manages to suck with it. And, uh, it's it's like a it's like a liberal bastion surrounded by a bunch of <laughs> in a state with multiple big cities. Okay, it's so the last one I know nothing about, so you're gonna have to take the lead on this. Uh, White Horse. Uh, that is the capital of. I, I think it's Ca- that is the uh, capital no, of the Yukon. It's Yukon. Yeah, it's, it's Yukon. yeah because Yellowknife. Yeah, because Yellowknife and Yukon are not the same. The two Y's are different territories. My uh, oh God. I mean, it basically doesn't even really exist, except it does, so I don't know. Fargo, North Dakota. Okay, so the correct name is actually Ukiadvik, which is the northernmost city uh, in the United States of America. So you were six for seven there. Better no, the no, it's Fargo. No, it's Fargo. Okay, so do you give yourself a seven for seven on this? Yes, and then I made a wish at 11-11. So you're mad you didn't go seven for seven. I no, I a thousand percent one. No, I a thousand percent one seven for seven. And now I and now I have the Arkell song eleven eleven stuck in my head. So get to get to your next question. Okay, so we're gonna uh, do the, the the this is the now serious part of the podcast in which we actually have to use our brains a little bit. Um, so Ooh, that's we'll not good. briefly, briefly talk about uh, Pennsylvania governor primaries because I just want to like run it over briefly um so obviously josh Shapiro ran unopposed to the democrats uh, on the gop side as expected doug mastriano won uh, mastriano ended up winning with uh, most counties barletta won a string of counties in the northeast part of the state which is his former congressional district so he won lackawanna Luzerne, which is scranton area and bill mcswain for whatever reason actually won chester county uh, which is suburban philadelphia and then dave white who came in fourth place won Delaware County by 17,000 votes or by 30%, which is quite interesting considering. Is he from County. Delaware County? I'm genuinely yes, asking. Okay, no, that explains so that. That's why he won it. But he won it, but like he, he left 51% of the vote there. He actually did really well there, even though he was from there. Like, I'm not going to lie. I have not looked at the county map yet since then. Is Barletta from the Northeast? Yeah, that was his former district. Okay. That like It's like you can literally, they're all contiguous. It's, it's just like, red pennsylvania and then you just take a paintbrush and just have a streak of yellow for barlaya you just that that's his district yeah i'm, so, I'm looking at, i'm looking at this for the first time so yeah no just because like i saw he won by like 21 he won by 24 i saw that one called pretty early in the night and then my focus just went to oz mccormick yeah i don't blame you the race is pretty uneventful um but okay so uh obviously doug mastriano is the worst candidate for the gop here McSwain and White were kind of more McCormick-y. They weren't, you know, super moderate by any means, but they were more, sub- you know, they were from suburban Philly. They weren't, um, they weren't running super Trumpy campaigns, but they were always kind of irrelevant. McSwain had a late kind of surge, but you know, he didn't. He wasn't really in a position to take on Barletta or Mastriano. Barletta was the front runner, him being a former representative, but apparent. So apparently, Trump. This is kind of funny. Apparently Trump didn't like Barletta because he lost the 2018 Senate race to Bob Casey by like 13 points or whatever. And like, not a great showing, but it's Bob Casey in a blue wave. What are you going to do? And so Trump thought Barletta was a loser. And that's why he endorsed Mastriano instead. And when told this, Barletta said, at least I'm not a sore, at least I'm not a sore loser. So, um, I mean, best comeback you can give when you lost the primary by 24% last night. But uh, yeah, Mastriano is the GOP nominee. Uh, and He's not super uh, 
not a fan. I'll, I'll say that. Um, he's he was at he was at the Capitol on January sixth. Doug Mastrano right. will not allow the twenty twenty four presidential election in Pennsylvania to be a fair election in any meaningful international sense. I mean, yeah, he'll pick the Secretary of State. He was at January sixth, so. Like like so, the like the twenty twenty four and the thing is even if Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or insert Democratic nominee here wins the popular vote in twenty twenty four, he will send his slate of electors to the to the Electoral College and and to Congress of a Republican. <laughs> like Master like Mastriano is the real like litmus test of like no no he is explicitly an authoritarian. And I don't disagree with that. Like this is this is the race that will determine whether or not the GOP has a moral compass such that there is a Republican candidate that suburbanites will not that there is a bridge too far. Uh so is the bridge I too mean, far? Does Shapiro win? Yeah. I think I I I, I have the race leading Shapiro. Um I, there's there's not like a great there's not like a really a great comp for for this right where like the environment's bad at least not that I could come up with in thinking about this briefly in 2018 there's no like Republican in a sort of like swing state who who really hung on like you could maybe the make the case that, yeah like 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 the Republicans DeWine. who held on were in yeah but Dewine won in a in a in an R8 state. But Cordray was, in all fairness, Cordray was pulling ahead of him for all, all of that race. And he was, yeah, but the, the race yeah, was but that, viewed yeah, as a toss up. Yeah, but that's because, that's because idiot pollsters are bad at this, not because, like, I'm trying to think, it's probably Hickenlooper, right? It's probably Hickenlooper in 2010. That's probably the, the, the right analogy, right? The Colorado GOP probably should have won that in, in the wave. And they lost it because they picked a, a, a ten buff. Yeah, was he? Did they? Did they run him for governor? Or did they run him for? No, uh, he's for senate. I'm not thinking. Of, no, you're right. Whatever. But, but they, they also lost the senate wasn't any better. Yeah, but this is the point, right? Like, um, Shapiro is like probably the best Democratic non-incumbent to run in a long time. Uh, and the thing, and the thing is, is that this has all the makings of the governor's edition of Ohio Senate 2018, which is the GOP. They don't even, they don't even bother with this one. Right. There's a, there's a good chance that the RGA doesn't spend a cent that Republican super PACs don't spend any money. They just, they, they just decide off the top that they're just done. With this race. They aren't going to burn money. And unless Mastriano can get close in some Republican internals in the next two months, I don't think the RGA spends any money. And if you see any governor races, especially where we know federal partisanship matters less, and in Pennsylvania where, uh, I mean, Tom Wolf won in 2014 in a red wave against oh, a Republican. Inc- yeah, like he, he smoked a Republican incumbent. Uh, like you can make the argument that the Pennsylvania Democratic Party in state elections is just going to, is just going to be able to outperform federal partisanship for a bit because they'll still be able to win over old union working class Democrats that are now Trump voters or Republicans for federal office. So, yeah, I think Shapiro is fine. What do you think? So I don't think. So here's the thing. Uh, There are two ways this could go, I think, broadly speaking. So first, like, I totally agree that the, Pennsylvania, like Pennsylvania is always pretty competitive. Like even in races where the GOP is fundamentally just in much better shape than Democrats, the Democrats have a floor of like 48% or 48.5%, which is quite high for a Rust Belt state because Democrats will sometimes just get smoked in states like Wisconsin or even Michigan. They've lost some races uh, there, you know, 2014, et cetera. Um, but Pennsylvania, I think with like with all the Democrats had with Mastriano being like, again, like you said, they might like the GOP, because here's the thing. If the GOP, like if their internals aren't 
like if by the fourth of July Macedonia is not close to Shapiro in these internals, like if he's down six, down seven in these GOP internals, they might just be like, nope, we're done with this race. We're going to go uh, try to you know maybe. I mean, did play you see? I mean, did you Nevada, see the RGA's? Did you see the RGA's um, statement today? No, what they say. I don't remember the exact verbiage, but this is not a race they're excited about. And this is not a candidate they're excited about having to having to play for, right? Like, yeah. and the thing about the GOP is they do have a pretty wide map of like good and not great pickup opportunities. So, can, actually, can I make a can I make a broader point about the governor's map that I know sure. I haven't seen anyone make? The GOP in twenty part of the reason the GOP had such a good twenty ten in the governor's um, map was because you had all of those two term democratic incumbents who won in 2002 term limited and a wave environment. The same thing happened for Democrats in 2018 where all those 2010 wave governors with the exception of, of Florida Democrats, just fuck them, obviously um, they all got to run in open races. This year, the GOP mostly have to fight incumbents, right? So they don't have any, like, other than Kansas, they don't really have any, like, guaranteed flips, right? They've got a bunch of, like, meh chances. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know how much to buy the polling, but, like, the polling suggests that Evers has a favorable near or I think Evers gets, no, I think he gets smoked. Whitmer, Whitmer keeps being ahead in the polls. I don't think many Republicans right now consider themselves favorites to beat Shapiro. Um, Arizona, like Arizona and Georgia Republicans don't feel great about their positions and holding their own states. Like the, the governor's map isn't great for Republicans. It's a, it's full of a bunch of good chances, not great chances. And so well, are they really going to bother playing here when they're going to have to defend Brian Kemp, when they're going to have to, I guess they're going to have to go in for Kerry Lake in Arizona when they're going to be her trying and Mastriano to. Mastriano are like the two people there because her and Mastriano are the byproducts of bad Trump endorsements in terms of electability for the GOP. So they got yeah, to pick but, one. Yeah, but yeah, but I think they're gonna. I mean, here's the thing: if you think if you think the GOP are going to leave Kerry Lake out to dry, she's like seventy cents on predictor right now. So. Go bet on the Democrats if you think that's if you think they're going to hang her to dry. I don't think they're going to hang her out to dry. I do think they're going to hug. They're going to they're going to hang Mastriano out to dry because the thing about Lake is she might be crazy, but there's not fucking video and photographic proof she was at one six. Yeah. Well, also she, Katie Hobbs. Like I was impressed by her a year ago, but her campaign is like I don't know what she's like. It, it's Twitter, but like. She has Connor Lamb. She has Connor which Lamb syndrome, which is that she's trying yeah. to like play it very low key and trying to run a great campaign for 1962. Yeah. Can we just like, can we just move on to shooting on Connor Lamb, please? Because that's really what I came on this podcast to do. But, okay. So let me do this though, because I was I want to start this. I will let you take the rein. Okay, so in January. I wrote a column saying that Connor Lamb was a better candidate for Democrats than John Fetterman, an opinion that both Evan and I, I know both of us hold. And like, he wasn't favored at that time, but he still had like a reasonable path to victory, I guess. Right. And, you know, in August, he announced, I think I called him like a front runner, but that was like last summer. That was, it was right after he announced whatever. But um, like, I don't know what he was like. He was evidently going to get smoked for probably a month before this primary. John Fetterman was actually running a campaign. Even like even Malcolm Kenyatta, who got 10% of the vote, was more like doing stuff in Philadelphia than Connor Lamb was. And Connor Lamb had the endorsement of the mayor, I think it was Jim Kenny, the mayor of Philadelphia. And he had all of the endorsements to have as a Democrat running in the primary. And he loses by 33% to John Fetterman, who is like, okay, I... Not a big veteran fan. I support a lame in this primary, but like, geez, I don't know what. Like, he went from a 2017, he was a 20 point under 20 point over performer, and, and now he is the butt of a two socialist joke about him being unable to overperform in elections that he should be winning easily. And now he lost a primary by 33 points to an unelected lieutenant governor. So, Connor Lame, I don't know what he's going to do from here, but 
absolutely disgusting showing for him on Tuesday night. So it's funny in that in January you wrote a column saying that he was a better candidate. I wrote that column in August or whenever that was announced. In January, I think the first U.S. column I wrote of the year was a column called Connor Lamb and the Campaign for Nobody. And the problem with Lamb's campaign, it was a great campaign to win. It was a great campaign to win like the close cigars, like old boys club of the past and it was a horrible campaign to win the center and i had to win the actual voters who vote in republican primaries or democratic primaries and the problem is that lamb never changed that right i don't know if you remember when he like almost got the party endorsement at the convention when he came like one vote shy and there was do you remember the story about like the fake poll it was allegedly a Fetterman internal, which had Lamb at 30%. Uh, I don't, I barely know it. I don't know enough. You should probably go ahead and describe it because I don't have any. There was, there was, it. there was a story there. I don't, I don't have any details. I never got, I never got told virtue of this poll, but there was allegedly a Fetterman internal, which had Fetterman at 35 and Lamb at 30. And that was being, you know, sent around on the interwebs as a way of arguing that actually lamp had momentum. And then <laughs> who's the Sean McElwee? Was that the, is that the dad for Parker's guy? Cause the FP was, so. D, yeah, DFP was Fetterman's pollster. He, he denied the poll existed. And then like three days later, they put out an internal with him with Fetterman up like 35 or some shit. And at that point I knew the column was right because yeah. lamb, that was the perfect, thing of like lamb had done a lot of things in early and mid January, right? He, he, he lined up a great slate of black endorsers and released it on Martin Luther King. He got union endorsements. He got local endorsements. He did a great like micro campaign job and he was 30 points down. He ran a horrible campaign. He ran an immensely horrible campaign. And at its core, at its fundamental core, Connor Lamb was a bad politician who did not know what he was doing. And I mean, at some point, like, why are we, why are we pretending to have respect for someone who ran a bad campaign? We gave Lamb the benefit of the doubt. We kept thinking that it was possible that something might happen, that he might come back and just because we didn't want to believe that he was running a campaign that's bad, but yes, he was. And it was obvious to me in January and someone, someone who wanted to believe in Lamb so badly because he was not a Fetterman fan, got in my mentions that day and said, I think this is too early for this call. Because what I said was if Lamb doesn't get his head out of his ass, he's going to lose and you're going to lose badly. Well, did he get his head out of his ass? No. Nope. Did he win badly? Did he lose badly? Yep. Exactly. Notch one for the scrim. Yep. Where does Lamb go after this, honestly? Uh, he prays to God Republicans win. He he either so he prays to God that Shapiro wins and appoints him replacement AG. Or he prays to God Republicans win his house district and then, and then runs back to the 17th in 2024. Or he might be or I mean, he might be done. Or, he might be done, I mean, but, yeah. but he could also be Secretary of State if he really wanted to, because that's an appointed position in Pennsylvania. Yeah, but like eh. the thing is, like, I just don't know that Secretary of State is a launching pad to anything. AG is a launching pad to stay in office again. Like he runs, he runs for AG in twenty four. That buys him some time. Something opens up, right? Maybe Fetterman loses this time. But Shapiro wins, and then he's the front runner for the twenty eight primary, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a long term game, right? So we'll have to see what Lamb. I mean, I mean that also that also assumes Connor Lamb could win the attorney generalship in twenty eighteen. Yeah, but yeah, well, that's probably. I mean, that's his best play. He doesn't have a good one. He uh, he doesn't like after this disastrous thirty three point like. Dude, like Fetterman got more than double Lamb's votes, which is just embarrassing showing. 
embarrassing. So, um, yeah, I so just for some Senate thoughts here, because right now, again, we're at a very in Al Gore, Florida primary between uh, Oz and McCormick. Um, we're just going to kind of address this. Uh, we'll talk in, in each situation I, uh, we talk about or dissect here. We'll do an uh, if that are men versus Oz matchup and then a Fetterman versus McCormick matchup. So Ooh, uh, Fetterman. Can- can I yeah, can I can I frame this? Let, let, let's frame this conversation in an interesting way. You can tell I've I've hosted a podcast before in my life because I'm just stealing your co-hosting job. But um, do you think Feder? Do you think McCormick is a meaningfully better candidate than Oz? Yes or no? I'm going to ask you. To- <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm well, I'm doing this. So okay. answer my question. Do I think McCormick is a better candidate than Oz? Uh, I honestly don't know what the whole there's like this online hatred for david mccormick in some like super right-wing spaces that are burnett or oz people right but like the thing with that is that it assumes that the voters in rural areas who would who would be more barnett slash oz inclined care enough but i just think that like with fetterman and the Democrat, the state of the Democratic Party today, like I don't think that McCormick loses that many voters in the rural areas, anyways. So, uh, yeah, I think McCormick does better in the suburbs than Oz. He does, but the state in the rural areas maybe a tiny bit worse. But like, who cares? So I don't really know. So the thing, the thing about that is, is that I would have understood that argument if McCormick had more strictly stayed to his like private equity business guy pro game error to moderate positions in winning the primary right had he gone full bad dolan in ohio but actually did the thing in one i'd get the argument because your basic argument is that master auto does your tur- does your turnout operation master auto being on the ballot does your does your rural turnout operation and then they all vote for you anyways the problem with that is mccormick is not like mccormick lost the philly caller most of the Philly caller. Um, and certainly did Winchester. I said most of. I mean, yeah, but I, like I put him on that out because he won Chester in Delaware. But yeah, nitpick. Yeah. Continue. And yeah, and he lost Burks and he lost Montgomery and he lost a bunch of other shit. So suck it. Um, okay, but I, in fairness, Barnett was from Montgomery. Yeah, he also came in third. Anyways, point being, it's not like he. It's not like he did super well in what you would think of as like the David McCormick, rich guy, like Republican, like rich Republican vibes places. And so what you're looking at is a situation where I don't think McCormick is like some great candidate for southeastern Pennsylvania. He's an actively bad candidate for northeastern Pennsylvania on these primary results. Fetterman will be a great candidate for Scranton. He'll be a great candidate for Wilkes-Barre. Uh, and then what you're looking at is a situation where how do Democrats not just run the Mitt Romney uh, 2012 playbook against him? How do they not just pull out every horrible private equity trade he's made, right? Every company he's ripped apart, every, uh, you know, every asset he's ever, you know, stripped for parts. How is that not the, the easiest democratic strategy of the 2020s? Well, that's a like it's a playbook. Strategy. It's a playbook Democrats know. It's a playbook that Bob Casey and John Fetterman fucking know. How is that not the plan? I mean, it, in fairness, we don't know what the plan is yet. Although, because the thing is, Fetterman has one of two options. He can either be like, for Democrats, he's hopefully shared ground, but he could also be like the like the. Like the not like he won't lose by as much as Paul Jean Square Engine did, but like there's like this hype among progressives. But the thing is, but the thing is, he's not a states, progressive. But like, like but the thing is, he doesn't come off as a progressive. But he is a progressive, though, and like no, I'm, I'm saying that it's his. But the thing is, but the thing himself, is, he doesn't give he a, a shit. But the thing is, he doesn't give a shit about like the woke stuff, though, right? Because the thing is, the the problem with like a Paul Jean Square Engine is that she like talks like she talks like a. Uh, she doesn't talk authentically to the people she's trying to represent, right? The the thing about those like West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, like red wall places in the UK, right? Like I wrote the first piece I ever wrote because I used to write for Decision Desk HQ sometimes. Um, back in the day, it was about the red wall. 
And it was about these places. They're culturally conservative and economically liberal. They're stop talking about gay people. Make my ad, add an ER to my rural hospital. That's those voters in a nutshell. It's not that they're even necessarily like actively homophobic. They would just like you to stop talking about like gay people and trans people and like Latinx and dumb shit. Right. I'm not saying those things are dumb, but in their view, these sorts of like dumb culture war language questions are getting in the way of real issues. And Fetterman speaks like that, right? Fetterman has disagreed with the Biden admin on Title 42 and immigration policy, right? It's a signal. And so he's not going to get blasted like most progressives usually do. Because the simple reason is he's a more astute politician than most people give him credit for. And the thing about Fetterman that I sort of keep coming back to is all the like, oh, Fetterman's just vibe stuff, like that's all bullshit. That's all like reductive nonsense from people who want to just paper over, like who just want basically the center of the Democratic Party to, to not give a shit about like policy views and the fact that like plenty of the things that progressives believe are dumb right the problem with this is all like fetterman the thing about like unique candidacies is that they're unique right the thing about like moments in time and candidates who can match the moment in time is that you can never you can never build it right i've written about this before but John Ossoff went from running the worst campaign of 2017 to the best campaign of 2020. You know why? Because the 2017 John Ossoff was not John Ossoff. He was a stage-managed character named John Ossoff. It was not the real human being. The real John Ossoff was the... Like, the real John Ossoff was the guy who went to Slutty Vegan, and then... As he's after he's done ordering his burger, he yells out to the team of people with him, like, you know, anyone want anything? As he's pulling out his wallet. That's the real John Ossoff. The real John Ossoff was the, you know, vaguely sweary, uh, you know, candidate on the stump. That was the real Ossoff. That was the Ossoff that we didn't see when he lost. It was the one that was there. And authenticity is a real trait. And trying to replicate the vibes is not going to work. So what you're saying then is that you are going to give John Fetterman some credit here for his ability to do retail politics. I'm not sure. I So I don't know yet because he hasn't held elected office before and because I don't entirely trust the hype because like there was a lot of hype. Right. And like I just I'm not entirely sure if it was uh, founded under good assumptions or assumptions that are going to be reasonable in six months from now. But um, I think Fetterman has the chance to be really good but i just right now i'm, I'm not entirely sure fetterman, i think, I think so, fetterman i think fetterman is a high upside high downside candidate whose like expected but, value ends up in roughly the same place as you know generic democrat um so but, then so one but like ten, fetterman Warrior fetterman can fetterman. win like this is going to sound crazy and, and don't like cut this. Fetterman has like wins by seven because McCormick just ends up being like a horrible fit for the electorate if that's the matchup. Like he has, he has wins by seven because McCormick just totally sucks. Upside. Lamb never had that upside. Lamb never had complete domination. He, he might have, you could argue he had a slightly higher floor, but he never had the close to the ceiling um, that Fetterman does, but I don't know. I think anyways, I ask your question. One to ten. Ten being he's favored and I love the guy and he's going to be the next Jared Brown. One being he's awful and he loses. Where are you on Fetterman? Stop acting like Sherrod Brown's a good candidate. He's not. He just has had the luck of running in three good electoral cycles. Uh, he won by seven. If he won by a point. I'll, 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 yeah, you know why? Because he had spent the GOP by $25 million. You, you, you're not allowed to hate on Jared Brown on my podcast. I'm say, allowed to. I'm allowed to hate on whoever the fuck I want on whatever podcast I am invited to be on. Anyways, uh, so with that, okay. So with that said, then it's like uh, a six. Fetterman, Fetterman's like Fetterman's like a seven. I don't know. 
I have him. I have okay, him like as a, I have, I have, so I have him as a slight underdog to both McCormick and Oz. So then, a with a with my so, but that's but that's but that's only because I'm expecting like an R four environment, like in any in a neutral in a neutral environment, Federman beats him beats either of them. It's not going to. I don't think it's going to be a neutral environment. Therefore, I think it's it's the leanest of winners. Okay, but then in that case, uh, Federman versus McCormick. Does it get bad for Democrats in the suburbs because McCormick is supposedly good there and Fetterman supposedly bad there, or do you think it's just the same? The thing is that I don't think McCormick gets like enough of a. I don't think McCormick gets enough of a suburban boost because he's like run away. Because the problem is, especially because he didn't get the Trump endorsement and he's going to be on shaky footing with Trump world the entire time. I kind of don't think he can go back to being the Jim Bush supporting pro gay marriage rich guy. And like, I don't think it's private equity. Like, I just don't think he can. I just don't think he can talk about his like private equity, pro gay marriage stuff. Like, I don't think he can go to Montgomery in a general and be like, "Don't worry, I'm one of you." Can he? When mega, he when mega world art, yeah, but mega world already looks at him like he's a, like he's a, he's a fraud, right? So, I mean, yeah, but the thing is, like. They're different markets. And if, like, and the like, thing is, he will definitely no, but he'll definitely talk to voters in Chester and Bucks than uh, differently than he will when he goes to Scranton or to Wilkesbury to or to wherever in northern Pennsylvania, right? Like, yeah, but can he? He'll yeah, be running different campaigns. But he can he tout because Romney's problem is that he could not tout being capital in Philly ads, right? So is he going to be able to talk about his his business acumen there? Is he going to be able to talk about his moderation there? Or is he going to have to be so single-minded about trying to get Republican turnout in every single one of his ads that because what he says in, in ads on Philadelphia TV is going to matter a lot more than what he says at events with a hundred and you know, 150 or a thousand people in the Philadelphia suburbs. So <laughs> Like I just don't know if he can go on TV with the message that he needs to to get a, a big suburban bump and get Fetterman. And the thing is, is that Fetterman's actual policy prescriptions are not particularly far from the average suburbanite. They, he is different than the average suburbanite in tone, but he is not. But like substantively, I cannot believe I'm about to defend the gun thing because obviously the gun thing was was deplorable, right? But like. If Fetterman goes into the suburbs and says he's tough on crime, is that a bad thing? I don't think it is. It'd be a, no, well, because it depends on where, though. Because, like, see, here's my theory about the Trump tough on crime 2020 thing. I think he did it wrong. He, like, the idea of scaring suburbanites into thinking that BLM is, like, this violent terrorist organization is viable in some places. But, like, but like when you pitted himself against, because BLM was actually wildly popular for a bit in 2020 when it first uh, started right because the, the thing is that I think he pitted himself against BLM and made it seem like he was just anti everything right when if he really just said riots bad we're going to be tough on crime I think it would have been slightly different I think he would have been viewed as like more moderate and less like insane by a lot of I think if I think if Fetterman I think if Fetterman does like a like does like a Bl- Tony Blair esque tough on crime tough on the causes of crime sort of like we're gonna we're gonna be tough on criminals but also support criminal justice reform i think that's i think that's catnip for white liberals in the suburbs and that doesn't seem far off of his like general disposition so but but does he run that campaign though against mccormick i mean like i don't like i think so i think so because i think so because the tough one because the tough on crime stuff worked great in western pa right yeah and the, and the thing is, and the thing is, is that I think the I think the black community is going to get behind him. I know the very online K hive black community are full of fucking crazy people who don't understand that vote blue no matter who is not asterisked by the sentence. Well, unless he's a meanie, no, vote blue no matter who means vote blue no matter who. And if you are, if you're calling the Democratic nominee trash on Twitter. Because your candidate, who was always going to lose, lost. You're not a Democrat. Fuck you. I think K Hive is viewed as deplorable by everyone not in K Hive. It's like bipartisanly, I think we all hate K Hive. But yeah, 
the the people who are going to vote for Fetterman but supported Lamb who think he's whatever it 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 it's nonsensical to me and that's coming from someone who supported Connor Lamb but uh, yeah, but the thing is, but the thing is, is that it's it's specifically hypocritical because these people hate the left for the supposed sin of, of Bernie not endorsing Hillary fast enough. That you have yeah. to remember that that is like K Hive's original organizing sin. Yeah, like that is it's, why they hate the left. So they are so they are all like actual hypocrites and fuck them all. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so. Just raw percentage here because I want to get to some conclusions on this show. Uh, what are the chances that Fetterman beats McCormick? And what's your current prediction margin as of right now? Will change, but as of right now, predictions. So I think it's 35. I think I think Fetterman has a 45% chance if it's McCormick. I think he has a 35% chance if it's us. So you think so you which we haven't really we haven't really talked about the odds battle much. We've mostly focused on McCormick, which no, I know what we're going to next, but yeah. Okay. Fine. So 35, 30, 40, 45%. It's like the leaniest of lean hours. I cut out, repeat that. 35% or 45% chance Fetterman beats McCormick. It's the leaniest of lean hours. I don't do toss ups because I'm not a coward. So you think so? Oz is a better candidate than McCormick in your eyes. Yes. Okay. So because the thing the thing about Oz is that he's a hard candidate to run against, right? Because the thing is, Oz presents you with a lot of um, like a lot of like notionally interesting fights, right? But Fetterman is well equipped equipped to fight exactly none of them, and even more importantly than that. Um, the the sorts of like so I had to write about this um, last year when I wrote a column about the line about Oz for the lines, um, and like Federer, Oz is like a whole like Wikipedia page of the controversies of the Doctor Oz show, right? It's quack medicines, it's bad guests, right? But it's like had a debate about um, conversion therapy, right? It's shit like that. Is that what John Fetterman wants to spend the next six months fighting about? No, God no. Is that what Fetterman? Is that what Fetterman, champion of Bratton, Bratton, Pennsylvania? Is that really the, the fight he wants? Was Doctor Oz stupid to have a pro um, conversion therapy person on his show? Like the the thing about McCormick is that he accentuates the argument. Um, he accentuates the argument that um, that Fetterman wants to have, right? What was what you saw Joe Biden's statement last night, right? Uh, he endorsed John Fetterman. Yeah. Yes, but did you see the language at the top of that statement? It was about working class. Yeah, working class voters in Pennsylvania have been dealt out for too long, and John wants to deal them back in. Yeah. How that's the message. That message works great against David McCormick. That, that, that message works amazingly against David McCormick because David McCormick is evil hedge fund guy, right? Connecticut private equity. Easy message to compel. Okay, but everyone knows that- everyone knows who Dr. Oz is and is, he's not easy to pigeonhole. I did not expect Dr. Oz to be the candidate of Scranton. Apparently he is. Uh, you know... <laughs> In fairness, the Dr. Oz is from Pennsylvania. I mean, McCormick lives in Connecticut. What's your point? The thing is, like, I'm not you even can't, you I'm cannot bring up you cannot bring up Dr. Oz's residence issues and then and then have your fucking dividing line be David fucking McCormick. I'm not making the argument, but I'm saying that uh, Oz has gotten bad press from being from New Jersey and the fact that he to be portrayed as an yeah and yeah and you know what happens yes and you know what happens the second john uh david mccormick is the official nominee his nine houses i don't know it's nine but there's going to be a thousand of them because he's a private equity rich boy the private schools kids go to in connecticut right it's all going to come out and democrats are going to use it every single day he <laughs> Connecticut, Connecticut rich fuck boy David McCormick versus Braddon, Pennsylvania's own 
John Fetterman is like a democratic consultant's wet dream. Dr. Oz, how the fuck do you run that game, man? For me, it really comes down to turnout. Cause like, I don't, cause I generally don't know how bad, like you're arguing that Oz is hard to run against the, Mc, the McCormick. Sure. 100%. But yeah, right. But, but how bad do you think rural turnout is for McCormick? I don't know. I think it'll be fine. Because I don't think, because I think he will put himself, like, I think it'll be fine. I don't think it'll be amazing. But I think the thing is, is that I think that Fetterman, I think Fetterman flips voters. I think Fetterman flips, tr- like, Obama, Obama Trump voters back against. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, I want to hear if you that. were, if you were a, if you were a, uh, an Obama Trump wolf. <laughs> KC Trump voter, I think you vote Fetterman <sighs> over McCormick. And I think you're more like, and I think more of those vote for Oz than they do McCormick. Yeah. Because again, but like, the thing you have to think about the issues, issues profile, right? Especially when you're trying to think about how Democrats beat like the national tide, right? Which we both agree is going to be bad for them, right? So they're swimming uphill, right? The issues mixed with Oz isn't great. It's it's dumb ephemera, right? It's is Dr. Oz really from Pennsylvania? Yeah, not the best issue. Because it's it's gonna just come off as oh, so we're just calling the brown guy not from Pennsylvania. <sighs> um two, I actually think more of I think McCormick primary voters are gonna more likely vote for Oz than um and Barnett voters are going to vote for Oz more than Barnett and Oz voters are going to vote for McCormick in a, in a general. And I think the bigger, biggest thing for me is like, again, Oz is an issues mix of trans rights and gay rights and abortion. And like, none of that stuff is good. John Fetterman territory, right? Fetterman's whole thing is that he'll tell, Exactly. But the problem is, though, is that that's just the issue mix you get when you get Dr. Oz, right? Because then you don't get to, because either you tap into that stuff, in which case you're off your message. You're off the message that wins you those Obama, Trump, Casey, Trump voters. Or you end up having, in which case you end up, or you end up litigating the wikipedia page of all the dumb shit dr oz has done then you get into a fight about opera then you get a fight about this you get a fight about that right and all the celebrity culture nonsense and that's just not a fight that john fetterman is well equipped to have and it's not a, it's not a fight that they're well equipped to win abortion becomes a much like I, i'm not crazy about john john uh john fetterman having a fight about abortion anyways but i'm sorry i think if he's running against a doctor, you know, no. I think I think Oz can play. I think Oz, I think Oz being a doctor increases the salience of abortion, and I don't think that's great for Democrats because then Fetterman is having to try and go to Western Pennsylvania and trying to talk about how he'd vote to codify Roe. Yeah, that's not a, and and that's also not ideal considering you're trying to get back the Obama Trump people. Or exactly. probably socially conservative, anyways. Yeah, those like the like those voters are like those voters are classic pro life Democrats, right? Yeah, and so I just don't love I just don't love the issues mix in an Oz candidate in, in against Oz. I like the issue mix a lot more against McCormick. Um. In the same way that Andrew Gillum like probably fucked up his race against DeSantis by making it all about how you know a hit dog collars and how DeSantis was you know like racy dog whistly towards him, right? Yeah, like I mean, Gillum like was full of missteps. Sure, but I do think I but I do think making that campaign about that, right, which went super viral on Twitter. I don't know how. I don't know if you were on Twitter in 2018. I was but um, it was like I remember the that that debate night where you know uh, Gillum accuses him of racism, DeSantis, you know, says some dumb shit, and then he goes, you know, ah, hit dog hollers. 
as my grandmother used to say, I hit dog collars, right? Gwen Graham would have run a better campaign solely oh, yeah, on the basis would. that yeah. solely on the basis that she would have kept the issues mix on better democratic terrain. Um even if I don't think Gwen Graham's some impressive politician, because I'm sorry, you're such an unimpressive politician that Andrew Gillum under FDI investigation fucking beat you. Wow, that's real impressive. <sighs> Not a fan of Gwen Graham, if you haven't noticed. But um, I can tell. Yeah, I just I like the issues mix so much more against McCormick, so I would rather run that. Like I, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of I were John Fetterman's campaign manager, which obviously I'm not and will not be. I'd much rather get to run the the deal deal them in, you know, uh, Delta deal them in campaign, and that's much easier to do against McCormick because he just gives because his record is so much more conducive to the argument you're trying to make than than Oz's record, and you it's so easy to get to get sort of like drawn into bullshit minutiae that isn't going to hurt with Pennsylvania voters in the way that's going to hurt with the national commentary app. I agree. I think, and especially because like the coalition that I think you're going to see in Pennsylvania is going to be right because turnout from um, the suburbs is, is in midterms is going to make up a higher share of the electorate, obviously. But like, do we really think that, uh, that McCormick, like, even with that, it's it, like working class still matters. Like McCormick probably like he might still win the race, but he probably loses Erie. Let's be real here. Cause Erie's down ballot, more democratic. Uh, he probably does. Does he underperform? By, does he underperform Trump in Lackawanna? Do you think? Oh yeah, he absolutely would. Yeah, he absolutely would underperform Trump in in the Northeast and probably pretty substantially win or lose. Um, and then, so then you're hoping that he can he can overperform in the in the cities and the in the suburbs of the cities, and he probably would because damn ballot effects and Fetterman's not like the world's greatest candidate for the suburbs, yeah. but. It's just such an easy campaign to run against McCormick. Yeah, there's definitely the path exists for Fetterman. It, it, it's to me, it's execution, right? Like because uh, the thing is, the thing is, Obama. Him, the thing is, the the Biden the Biden like deal them in statement was clearly language worked on with Fetterman's campaign. That was yeah. too coordinated, too fast, right? That that binds like I don't have inside knowledge. I don't have like I you know I, I don't have sources or whatever on this, but like clearly that Obama that Biden statement was said was written days ago, if not weeks ago now, right? Oh yeah. And the thing about the thing about that statement was that it was very clearly like that was the that was the tell of what the camp what they want the campaign to be about, right? Economic justice, pocketbook issues. It's the it's the Casey it's the Casey Wolf playbook. And the, and the Casey Wolf playbook was avoid abortion, right? Was to talk about how rural hospitals don't have the same number of, you know, how, how the GOP can't be trusted to, to protect rural hospitals, right? That's the Pennsylvania Democratic playbook that works, that can work really well in, in, in getting some of that aversion. And I just don't love the issues mix if you start to get into fights about whether or not the fucking Dr. Oz show was transphobic four years ago, which it yeah. probably was. But that's just not an issue mix that works well when you're running John fucking Fetterman. I agree with that. I, I definitely think that McCormick is going to, like, especially, like, if it's Lamb, maybe it's different. But, like, again, Lamb, as we have seen throughout this primary, is incompetent at running campaigns, evidently. But, um, yeah, so... We're going to try to wrap this up now with uh, these two. So recap then. Like, let's just, just for fun. I how, So obviously you think McCormick is easier to run against than, Fetter, uh, than uh, Oz is. How much do each of them beat Fetterman by? And what are the odds that that changes by September, October? Just briefly. Uh, I have McCormick by one. I have Oz by two. Hmm. It's uh, close. Even even for us, it's pretty close. Yeah. But you know, I'm also I'm also I think like I'm I'm still buying into some amount of a I think the Pennsylvania Geo Democrats probably have my respect more than almost any other um state Democratic Party. I think them and the Georgia Democrats are really the only two where I look at them and meaningfully go, 
like state organization and just sort of like general, you know what the fuck you're doing gets you the benefit of my doubt. Uh, Florida Democrats get the inverse of this. Um, In North Carolina, like briefly, no one hates North Carolina Democrats enough. They're awful. They lose so many winnable races. Yeah, I want to see. I want to see if Sherry Beasley can can like just even get something going. Like, I'm not expecting her to win. She's not going to. I have that like very likely are. But um, so it's funny. I wrote about. Uh, I wrote. I so I pre wrote my betting column for this week, or which is presumably will have come out by the time you were listening to this podcast. Um, assuming my editors get to it. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I pre-wrote it, and basically I decided that there are four interesting competitive center, Senate seats this year, because Democrats are only winning Wisconsin and North Carolina in circumstances in which they are somehow winning, you know, when they have already won every other competitive Senate seat, and there's no universe in which Republicans are winning New Hampshire, but not winning all three of, or not all four of Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia. So I only bothered previewing the big four races. And so I know I told you I was I was, I was increasingly pessimistic on um, uh, the Reverend. I am now back to his slight favorite in the race. Just FYI. Okay. That is um, my Democratic heart is warmed. Thank you. Yeah, I have, I have, I have, I have Arizona. I have Arizona. Lenar, I have Georgia's like a Democratic tilted toss up, and I have Arizona or I have Nevada lead day. Yeah, I think Cortez Master holds on too. So you're at what 48 seats for the Democrats or no 49? 49. 49. Yeah, and then this is Tiltar with McCormick, Lenar with Oz. I don't use tilts because tilts are for cowards. So it's still lean with the. Uh, they're they're both they're both lean ours, but Oz is more is closer to likely. Okay, tilts are fun, by the way, but okay, tilts uh, are for no. cowards. No, I'm, no, tilts are the tilts are me saying I don't feel strongly anyway, but it probably goes this way. Yeah, whatever. exactly, exactly. You know what? You know what the problem with that is. Well, but, but I'm not going to lie, but like, like, I'm not going to say like, I absolutely think Herschel Walker beats Raphael Warren in Georgia and I'm going to die on this hill. It's just like, no, nah, he probably wins. But like, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's not mind blowing to me if uh, Warren. No, no, wins. no, no. My problem, my problem is, is not that I'm asking you to fake, to fake a take that you don't have. You're a coward for not having strong takes in the first place. No. Yeah. That's a. Yes. Just uh, yes. Okay. Yes. I, you know why? No, I don't want to know why. You know why? Because you, you, you like to have strong takes. I, I like to have strong takes on things I only feel strongly about. I don't. I don't enjoy. like to have strong takes. This is just who I am. You think you think you know the darkness? I was born into the darkness. Was that a Batman movie that quotes from? I haven't seen Marvel, by the way. So Batman isn't around. Marvel. It's DC. Okay, well, I want to say that was like Bane or the Joker or something. I don't know. So you're at lean Republican for both Oz and McCormick. I'm it at was it lean. was Bane. It was Bane, and you were not you were not cutting out this great banter. It's great. No, I'm I'm, I'm cutting out other parts. Whatever. Okay. Uh, Oz and McCormick, both of us have this lean Republican. I'm slightly more um, bullish on both of them. I think uh, McCormick wins by two, and I think Oz wins by four. But like. The four is more an estimate of, of that because I think Fetterman, like you said, he either, right, because it, he has the McCormick playbook. The Pennsylvania Democrats have the McCormick playbook. I think with Oz, they're a little just kind of not there yet. So four is a generous estimate because it's just, I don't know yet, but like I'll move it down to three if, you know, we get indications. If it's Oz for Fetterman, we get any good, good stuff for uh, Fetterman. But yeah, so both at lean Republican. We're both at lean Democrat for Shapiro versus Mastriano because Mastriano is what we could reasonably call a crazy person, and Shapiro is a overperforming attorney general who the Democrats are probably going to invest in. The Republicans are probably going to pull out of Pennsylvania, not probably, but they there's a good chance they pull out of Pennsylvania within you know before summer ends. 
So, uh, yeah, that is uh, that is it for this episode of the show. Evan, I greatly appreciate you coming on. I'll, I'll let you uh, wrap it up for today. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Scrimshaw. Follow uh, my my podcast on Twitter at Scrimshaw underscore show. Uh, follow Ryan on Twitter at whatever the fuck his ad is. It's just his name. It's it's not that hard. It's at Ryan Jakubowski. That's disrespectful. It's just my name. Yeah, it's then, just yeah, my it's, name. Yeah, but it's more fun to shit on you uh, for everything in life. Um, buy my book, Salvation of the Storm. It's great. Ryan can tell you it's great. He. He, he, he left it. Actually, fun fact, I had him muted on Twitter until he tweeted that he was going to buy my book and someone sent me that tweet. And then, I, and then I followed and unmuted. So, Salvation of the Storm, why are you listening to this podcast right now? So, pro tip, if you want Evan to unmute you on Twitter to unblock you or to get the Scrimshaw follow back, you can buy his book, read it, uh, and very good book. I greatly enjoyed it. You should buy it. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming on. It was, it was a pleasure to have you on. You're welcome to come back anytime you would like. Thanks for having me. Adios.